Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today to talk to you about uh, species at risk and, and species at risk birds. And Dirk uh, gave a very bri brilliant uh, segue into my presentation because I'm going to give you just a little bit of a 101 on the Endangered Species Act, which is brand new in Ontario, uh, just came into effect in June 2008. And it's kind of governing our lives at MNR quite a bit lately, and, it, and it's kind of a really neat piece of uh, legislation, actually. Um, so uh, my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Species at Risk Act. And e like sometimes I think the business of conservation is all about knowing the acronyms. So we're going to talk about the ESA and uh, about the terminology around the, um, that we use for, for designating species status, because uh, Dirk talked a little bit about that, and I'm going to talk a tiny bit about it. About the CERO list, so the species at risk in Ontario list, so that's the list that we go to to find out what species are protected under the ESA. And then I'm going to just talk about some of the species at risk birds that we have here in Muskoka. And uh, we're kind of fortunate in some respects that we do have some kind of uh, areas where they're still doing kind of relatively well, um, and uh, some that are maybe not doing so well in some of the conservation issues around them. And then I'm going to finish off with just a little bit about uh, reporting uh, these. So if you know where these things, these creatures are, um, we're really interested in knowing that information because we're in the business of trying to track it. Some of these species are newly listed and it wasn't until they became listed that we um, needed to know exactly where they are and so this is a bit of a plea for more information as well. Okay, so this is a wood turtle, it's not a bird, obviously, it's endangered and there's a few kind of random pictures interspersed in here, but there's four levels of status that we uh, consider under the ESA now. And uh, so the worst level is extirpated because it means they ain't here no more. And uh, the next level down is endangered, which means they're at risk of becoming extirpated. A wood turtle's an example of that. We don't have wood turtles in Muskoka here, actually. They're found in Algonquin Park immediately next to us, but not here in Muskoka. Uh, the next level down is threatened, and threatened just means at risk of becoming endangered. And then the lowest level is special concern. And that's sort of the uh, level that an animal goes from being not really something we're thinking about too much to being, oh my goodness, we better think about this. And an example of an animal that recently became designated special concern is the snapping turtle. And that just happened about a year ago or so. Was it a year or a year and a half ago or so that the snapping turtle got listed? Something like that, anyways. So as I mentioned, the Endangered Species Act is a new, new um, piece of legislation and um, so biologists like myself and environmental consultants like Rob and Dirk are really kind of uh, struggling with how to make this work in real life because, uh, you know, for us Ontarians life continues and we have new piece of legislation and we have new information all the time about new animals that are becoming at risk. And uh, really we're struggling with how to kind of pull this all together and make the legislation work as well as you know, kind of letting people continue to work and not going so well at times. But there's some really, really good things about this new piece of legislation. And one of the things is that it's a science-based assessment that allows species uh, information to be considered before they become listed. So CACERO it stands for Committee on the Status of Species at Risk in Ontario. CACERO is good enough. And basically that's a group of people composed of scientists and academics and really knowledgeable people that review all the best data to try and decide whether an, an animal is at risk or not. And so that's a good thing because it means it's not a political thing, you know, it's based on really good science. And then there's a whole process that happens once this committee evaluates a species and designates its status, there's a whole process by which it gets onto that seral list. And uh, so the CERO list is on the MNR website and you can just Google S-A-R-O and it comes up right away and you can see all the animals that are currently on the list and their statuses. What's the plural of status? Stat I? Um, uh, so you can see that on the list there and uh, not only birds but all the other different animals as well. And you can link to uh, some good fact sheets and you can link to range maps so you know where in Ontario these things are found and if in fact they're found here in Muskoka. So uh, anything that becomes on this uh, CERO list automatically receives legal protection under the ESA. And the ESA, in a nutshell, it's a very complicated piece of legislation, but basically in a nutshell it says that you can't hurt or harm the animal or harass it or kill it or take it in defense of your property or you, there's a whole bunch of adjectives that are there. And um, for many of the animals that are protected under the ESA, there's also protection for their habitat as well. And that's been a bit of a complicated thing to address 
because of a whole bunch of different reasons and not the least of which that the habitat for some animals is a really hard thing to nail down because some of the animals that are at risk are really what we call habitat generalists which means they get by by roaming a very wide area and by using a lot of different habitats and so when it comes to protecting the habitat of an animal like that it's really hard to sort of specifically say you know you must protect this feature or that feature um, and there's uh, also, uh, the ESA also prescribes an opportunity to regulate habitat for animals, which means coming up with a specific um, description of their habitat so it's very clear what habitat features or even what habitat area might become protected. So I'll just give you one example. There's a little plant called the Engelmann's quillwort. It's a really nondescript plant. Uh, it's endangered in Ontario and it's only found in two places in all of Ontario. Uh, one of which is in the Severn River and the other uh, is found in the Gull River over near West Guilford in Halliburton. And so the regulation, is the, the regulated habitat for that particular plant is just a description of the exact area where it's known to grow. It's actually, it actually grows in the water, uh, kind of water about that deep type of thing. So uh, in that sense it's easy, it's just a map that's the regulated habitat. But for other animals where the habitat has been described in a specific way, it's actually a description of the features where the particular animal or plant happens to live. So that's sort of the ESA 101. Um, if I, I did bring some brochures and they're out there on one of the tables and on the MNR website if you're interested in more information on the legislation, there's, there's all kinds there and it's really easy to find. So what I'm going to do is just to go through a few of the species at risk birds that we do have here in Muskoka. And um, a little bit about sort of where we know they are and what the conservation issues are around them. And uh, there's some kind of interesting stories about them. So Henslow Sparrow is, uh, oh, I forgot, I stuck this map in here. Um, another really good source of information about birds is the Atlas of the Breeding, bird, uh, breeding Birds in Ontario. And uh, this is a published book, but you can also go online and get maps on different uh, birds as well. And this is a map of uh, the nighthawk, the uh, distribution of nighthawks uh, according to where they're known to breed. And what's of interest here and kind of scary is that these black dots refer to breeding bird atlas squares where they were known to nest in the previous atlas, so the one before this one, but don't, aren't known to nest in the current atlas. And uh, so, uh, there's a so nighthawks are now listed as special concern in Ontario. And when you look at the other uh, birds that are um, protected by the ESA on that seral list, you will see very similar maps. So there's some really scary declines occurring for the for a number of the birds. And uh, there's a constant theme there. You know, I was thinking about uh, Rob and Dirk talking about habitat mosaics. But the theme that seems to be constant to me about a lot of the birds that are at risk in Ontario is that they're insect eating birds. And uh, most of the birds that have become recently listed are insect, insectivores. And um, you know, we, we hear a lot of discussions about global decline in insect populations and in changes in insect populations because of climate change and things like that. And uh, the, 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 the strong link is there, and uh, I think it's pretty scary stuff. But I, I wanted to identify the, uh, this source of information to you and just sort of identify uh, what some of the conservation issues are. So Hensel Sparrow, uh, not too much to say about this bird. It's endangered in Ontario, and I think across Ontario it's just known now in a handful of locations. It's a field nesting bird. It's a little sparrow, very nondescript, I think, sort of a a brown uh, little guy. And um, Muskoka would not be uh, a strong area that it ever would have occurred because when you think of prior to the Europeans kind of coming through and opening up the forest, this area was covered by deep dark pine forests and there would have been no habitat. But there is one published reference that was sent to me of a record of Henslow Sparrow near Port Sandfield, and which is really bizarre and I think the record, I tried to find it when I was uh, preparing for this talk and I couldn't find the paper but it goes back to about 1912 or the early 1900s and um, I mean nobody can ever really go back and verify if that's indeed what they saw or what the story is there but that is the sort of the, um, the historic the uh, the records for Hensel Sparrow for uh, for uh, Muskoka. Peregrine Falcon is really interesting 
Uh, it's a threatened species now. It used to be an endangered in Ontario, and I guess you could view peregrines as being one of the good news stories as far as species at risk birds. Um, they were very susceptible to the use of DDT in, uh, across Canada, in fact, which was a, a pesticide used for mosquito control and other bugs. And uh, what happened was that it uh, infiltrated the food chain and uh, making a long story short, I don't understand the chemistry very well, but it caused eggshell thinning in peregrines and bald eagles as well. So there was basically, uh, the adults would lay their eggs, but the eggshells were not strong enough to support the weighted incubating adult, and there was just basically failure of nesting altogether. So uh, peregrines used to nest historically in Muskoka. There's about a dozen sites where they, um, they used to nest. Uh, they're not here again yet, but I think we can be hopeful that they may again be here because they really are beginning to rock and roll across the province. And uh, so some of the um, former traditional areas where peregrines used to nest, they're now back and uh, they're, they're really going. And um, every five years a peregrine survey is done and uh, we go back and look at some of the historical nesting sites where they used to nest or were known to nest here in Muskoka. And uh, check them out. No, no luck so far, but I'm hopeful one of these times, you know, we may see them again. And um, this is sort of a, a one of the spots where they were known to have nested. And um, so peregrines are cliff nesting birds, and they uh, like to eat sort of pigeon-sized birds. And uh, if you talk to Peter Gore, and he knows and he's told me there's a spot on Lake of Bays where they used to nest not too far from Dwight looks similar to this Solitaire Lake is another location so there's about a dozen sites anyways across uh, Muskoka where they used to nest and this is Skelton Lake here <coughs> Whippoorwill is uh, another uh, species just recently got listed probably about two years ago and uh, everybody knows what the sound of a whippoorwill is like but nobody's ever for very few people can really say that they've ever seen one. They're um, active singers at night time. They like to sing around the, the, the time of the full moon. But they're really cryptic colored birds. So uh, they're the same color as uh, other sort of grays and browns and very uh, cryptic colors. So very difficult to see them, especially since they're only out at night time. And their habitat is rock or, or rock barrens with uh, tree cover interspersed. So if you have an area sort of 50% open area and 50% tree cover, that's a uh, very good habitat for um, whippoorwill, whippoorwill. And in Muskoka, they tend to be more found sort of south of Lake Muskoka across uh, sort of the town of Gravenhurst, the Cashy Lake area, as Alan knows well, right across the southern part of Lake Muskoka and kind of up the Georgian Bay Coast is the best area habitat for whippoorwill. And uh, we still have, uh, you know, reasonably good habitat for them uh, in this part of Ontario. But globally, their uh, populations are really crashing, and uh, they're of course insect-eating birds. And uh, so there's that link to the insect thing there again. And this is what they look like. This is a picture I think I got off the MNR website, or maybe I got it off Google and found it on Google. I'm not sure. But just sort of proves the point that they're very cryptic colored birds. I think this is the same picture that Dirk had in his presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same sources. Nobody ever has pictures of whippoorwill in their own collection. And this is an example of uh, good whippoorwill habitat, where you have sort of open areas mixed with trees, and um, uh, sort of a 50% mosaic there is, is good habitat for them. And as I mentioned, uh, conservation issues include loss of habitat and loss of those, uh, uh, loss of the insect population that uh, link to global changes in insect declines. Chimney swift is kind of a really interesting bird that I just learned to learn to know more about not too long ago. So um, they uh, nest in hollow trees and. Uh, well, they used to nest in, in hollow trees and roost in hollow trees sort of prior to Europeans coming here. But when Europeans came to North America, they created a new <coughs> source of habitat for them, which was chimneys. Hence, they're called chimney swifts. And um, it's not really known for sure whether their populations really increased with this new source of habitat. But you can imagine when they first, when people first came here, they built these really sort of uh, crappy chimneys by today's standards so uh, animals could go in and they were big and um, uh, masonry, so built of rock or masonry or whatever. So there's a really good habitat for them. 
And now chimney swifts are a, a threatened species and it's partly because uh, that source of habitat, the chimneys, have changed a lot. So people are building uh, environmentally better chimneys, so that's good from environmental uh, reasons. But they put caps in the chimneys to keep animals from going in them, and they're building them in a... In a and people don't use chimneys much anymore, right? There's different energy sources and, and ways of heating homes. So that uh, habitat source is, is gone for them. So um, there's two types of... of uh, I was going to say chimneys, but uh, structures that they use. Uh, they nest in pairs or in maybe a hollow tree. There's not very many locations known uh, for these nesting, but they roost communally, which is really interesting. So it could be hundreds of birds communally roosting in a, in a chimney, and, um, which is really kind of uh, neat because there's very few uh, structures that really kind of meet that need. And uh, I'll just show you. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story about chimney swift, which is kind of why I got to know them. So this is the roof of the old Empire Hotel in Huntsville. And uh, there's probably two or three hundred chimney swifts that used to roost in the chimney there. And then a couple of years ago, the old Empire Hotel burnt, which was really just a tragedy, I think, for the people living there and using that as their business. Um, and it was, it was a tragic thing because the building had to come down and the, uh, the roosting chimney there um, had to be taken down. It was just a terrible hazard after the building burned. Um, chimney Swiss are really interesting because they're not able to perch like a robin on a branch. They can't do that. They spend all day long flying around um, hunting for insects and then at night what they do is uh, they, they kind of swirl around the chimney and then down they go and then they, they cling to the side of the masonry. So chimneys that are suitable for this have a really rough interior like a brick uh, interior that's very rough so that and they cling on it all night long and then in the morning the chimney swifts kind of let go and they just kind of fall down and then they fly up and then they spend the whole rest of the day flying around like this. Getting my picture. <laughs> so I apologize I had a couple of videos embedded in this presentation and for some reason they're not working so just pretend this is just a really short clip that I took of just a bunch of chimney swifts it's just um, my husband and I went up to Huntsville one night the year before the chimney got taken down and watched them go into the chimney. And so just pretend there's a whole bunch of black dots and I just got a video just about 20 seconds of them swirling around like that. So they all congregate just at the right time of the night and how do they all know to do this? Who knows? Kind of swirl around like that, just hanging out, twittering away. They make quite a distinct call, which uh, if you learn that call, you will pick that up wherever you are. And then this is a neat video of them going in the chimney, and it's kind of maybe just as well that you uh, can't hear the video, like there's an audio there, and my husband and I are just kind of watching this, and we're saying things like, oh man, that's so cool, and other really <laughs> nerdy things. <laughs> but but it, it's really kind of neat, because the, the swifts kind of swirl around like that, and it's like all of a sudden, somebody flips a switch, and within, a, it hadn't, wouldn't have been 10 seconds, they all, like 200 of them, all went down the chimney, just like that. And that's what this video would have shown, and I'm very sorry I can't share it with you because it really is quite cool, even if there are two nerds in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's a sad story because uh, the, the hotel burnt and it was falling over in a safety hazard and uh, we had to give them a permit to destroy the building. And the, the, we tried to, you talk to Jim Griffin who's here and he'll tell you the story of what we're trying to do to make up for the lost chimney without success so far. A, a sad story, but anyways, we'll see. I know of in all of Perry Sound District of MNR that I have responsibility for or, or work in. There's two chimney swift chimneys that I know of. One in Spruce Dale, and then this one in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've moved to another chimney in Huntsville, but it's not working out quite so well. So moving on a little bit, bobolink and meadowlark are um, two bird species. Again, both both recently listed. Bobolink a couple of years ago, and meadowlark quite recently. And these are birds of uh, old field habitats. So um, if you can think of an old field that maybe used to have been farmed and hasn't been mowed in a number of years, but before it starts to succeed to a forest and before there's very much shrub cover that's starting to grow there. So they say fields that are sort of between eight and maybe 20 years of age um, make really good bobolink and metalark habitat. They're both insect eating birds. And they both nest on the ground. And they both have quite distinctive songs, and um, 
so it's kind of easy, even if you're not really good at getting your binoculars on them at time, you know, if you clue into to their songs, you can identify them. And um, there's, we still have quite a bit of habitat for them here in Muskoka, which I think is partly to do with the fact that we've got lots of abandoned farmland here. And these two species both can benefit from selective mowing, actually, to keep those old fields from uh, turning into a forest again. And uh, we are still looking for observations of these species. I'll tell you, as I mentioned, I'll tell you in a minute about uh, how to tell us if you know where these are. Yeah, Dirk talked about these better, and that's an, this is another example of a bird that we still have. Uh, we have uh, a, a number of records of them here in Muskoka. Their habitat is cattail marshes, and they're uh, a kind of bird you're not likely going to see. But again, if you know what their call is like, what their song is like, you might have better luck in actually tracking them down. Mm -hmm. And the conservation issues around least bittern is around loss of wetland habitat, which in southern Ontario, of course, uh, in some parts of southern Ontario, wetlands of uh, you know 95, up to 95 percent of wetlands have been lost, and that's contributed to um, the conservation issues around this particular bird. Golden winged warbler is special concern, so. Um, SC, special concern, and we do have a number of uh, records of this particular bird. They're quite distinctive, again, another distinctive call and uh, quite distinctive looking. They like uh, early successional scrub habitats and the edges of forests and recently logged areas. And they're fairly common in Muskoka right along the south end of the shield, not so, mar so much farther north in Muskoka there. Red-headed woodpecker is another one, too. Uh, again, a special concern species. I think these are the most striking woodpeckers that we have in Ontario, but we could argue about that. Uh, they like open woods, which is a bit different than the other woodpeckers that are quite common here in Muskoka. And if you talk to Al Sinclair, there's just a, a, a one or two nesting records of them right in southern Muskoka. So uh, um, their, ha their conservation issues are around habitat loss in southern Ontario due to urbanization and the intens intensification of farming and the loss of woodland habitat in southern Ontario. And really, in Muskoka here, we're really at the very northern limit of the range, and so there's just a few records right at the, sort, the south end of the, um, south end of the uh, area. Olive-sided flycatcher is another one. Um, their call is quick three beers, <laughs> and um, I don't know if anybody's heard this, but that's, we did that, that's really quite good. <laughs> really, it sounds like they're saying quick three beers, it's kind of quick three beers, kind of, yeah, yeah, just like that. <laughs> so for those of you who are interested in bird calls and want to uh, know more about that, the Cornell University has a great website that you can find and um, type in the bird that you want to know what their call sounds like and you can play it right on their website. It's just a great source. So if you hear something or you're just not sure or you think you might have bobblings in the field down the road from your house or whatever, uh, you know, it's very, you can kind of get that song in your head and then go and it's helpful, you know, when you're not likely or it's difficult to get your binoculars on something, then having that call in your head can be really handy. Unless you're like me, where you listen to it and you think you know it, but then you get out there and you've forgotten. That's always a problem, too. So uh, all the slide flycatchers are, again, um, insect-eating um, birds, and they like to sit on branches, and their, their habit is to swoop out, snatch insects, and then and fly back. And, um, and they're, so they're really, they really key in on forest edges. And where I've heard uh, all, um, all the slide flycatchers has been in areas where there's a lot of the mosaics that we were talking about before are wetlands and, and forests. And um, that tends to be a good place to go and find them. Bald eagles, special concern, another good news story where it used to be that bald eagles were um, endangered in Ontario. They're the same problem as with um, um, peregrine falcons with DDT. But at MNR, we get reports from people seeing bald eagles all the time now, mostly in the wintertime. They're actually fairly common. I've actually been sitting at my desk at MNR and seen them out my window. And this is a picture of an immature bald eagle, which tells me something that um, I, we took at Axe Lake, which is just northwest, or yeah, northwest of Huntsville last summer. So if there's immature bald eagles hanging around, then you know, obviously, you know, something's happening that's very positive for their population. Like I said, they're a very common winter visitor here in Muskoka, and um, 
they are good scavengers, so they're meat-eating birds, uh, 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 carn um, what am I trying to say here? Thank you. And uh, they are very happy to take advantage of, uh, of carrion or dead things that they might find. And uh, I know the conservation officers at my office have commented to me a number of times about, you know, they get called out about to roadkill deer and that kind of thing. And they've scared up kind of flocks of bald eagles from them on occasion. So that's kind of neat. So just a few others. Uh, and I'm not going to go into any more detail, but just to kind of get these on your radio, uh, radar screen, uh, Dirk talked about cerulean warblers. Um, again, not never would have been common here, but just found at the southern end of Muskoka. Black terns, barn swallow is another example of a bird that used to be um, very common across Ontario and now recently got listed as threatened, and common nighthawk. And uh, you can still hear common nighthawks. You go in downtown Bracebridge, for example, in the summertime, you'll hear them kind of calling and flying around <coughs> above that urban area, you know, looking for the insects that they. Um, that they eat. So, just a little bit about reporting. Um, as I mentioned, we're interested in reports of, of these things. Uh, there's a website you can go on to. The MNR has a place called the Natural Heritage Information Center. And um, you can just, uh, if you see something, you can just click on report rare species and it just kind of lets you sort of follow through on how you can report that. You can report those observations to me because I come in to um, have the occasion to find out about these things and I submit these sightings as well and this is all helpful to for, for the scientists to, to sort of uh, track these things and they revisit the status of these uh, <coughs> creatures you know every once in a while and all the information will be helpful in making them make a good decision in the long run and for more information on species at risk as I mentioned the MNR website and the Royal Ontario Museum website and that Atlas of the Breeding Birds of Ontario is a really great source of information for me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need to get the one in the next time.